This is a mechanism of disease map for cirrhosis. I'll be talking about the many etiologies of cirrhosis, the pathophysiologic mechanism of cirrhosis, and some of the manifestations of this disease. Now, this um, chart isn't completely exhaustive of the manifestations of cirrhosis. Um, you'll see that cirrhosis affects many other organ systems, like the kidneys and the lungs, and I just couldn't fit everything downstream of those here. But I think I've covered the highlights and um, most of the important mechanisms here. As in all of these mechanism of disease maps, uh, we have the core concepts that are color-coded according to this legend up here. So take a screenshot if you want, or um, I'll clear everything and kind of go through it one by one. We're going to start with the pathophysiology first. Um, in general, the pathophysiology is that cirrhosis is caused by inflammation in the liver that then leads to scar tissue in the liver, and that eventually affects your blood flow, which will damage your um, normal functioning of the liver. So first, you have these Kupfer cells. These are liver macrophages that destroy hepatocytes. This destruction of hepatocytes activates hepatic stellate cells, which then trigger more downstream inflammation. That downstream inflammation um, triggers the release of many cytokines like platelet-derived growth factor and TGF-beta, and that in turn um, causes even more inflammation, more stellate cells, which then activate myofibroblasts. Myofibroblasts are these cells that produce the collagen, they produce connective tissue. And because you have so many of them, you end up with excess collagen and excess connective tissue. And when you have so much collagen, fibrotic stuff in the liver, it starts to replace the normal liver parenchyma. Again, this is the process of fibrosis. When you have so much connective tissue in the periportal and centriolobular zones, you'll have these regenerative nodules and fibrous septa that start to compress the hepatic sinusoids, and you'll lose the normal fenestrations in the liver. Now remember, these fenestrations are these complex structures in the liver that allow for this blood filtering, this very complex system of blood flow through the liver that leads to detoxification and processing of things in your blood. And when you have so much scar tissue that you ruin all of that structure, you won't be able to do those things. When you mess up the blood flow, you'll have elevated portal vein hydrostatic pressure, which leads to increased pressure in the intrasinusoidal space. And again, that'll contribute to poor blood flow, which further exacerbates this pathophysiology. So again, in short, inflammation leads to a bunch of scar tissue, leads to poor blood flow. And when you have all these cytokines that can stimulate hepatocyte apoptosis, which can further worsen things, and as I mentioned before, all of this extra connective tissue gets in the way. It's kind of a mass effect. Um, that, on top of the poor blood flow, leads to impaired substrate exchange. And all of this leads to loss of exocrine and metabolic functions of the liver. Now, before we talk about the manifestations, let's talk about the varied etiology of cirrhosis and where these etiologies insert themselves into this pathway. There are two big buckets here. You can have things that cause hepatotoxicity, and you can have things that cause hepatitis. So things that are toxic, um, foreign exogenous materials that are toxic to the liver, and um, foreign exogenous materials that cause inflammation of the liver. Um, and uh, there are a few scattered ones at the bottom here that are vascular causes of cirrhosis, and we'll cover those as well. So first, hepatotoxicity. Long-standing alcohol use is one of the more common causes of cirrhosis. It's well known that alcohol, um, when you drink a lot of it for a long time, is toxic and can cause cirrhosis. Some medications are known to have hepatotoxic effects. This includes amiodarone, acetaminophen, and methotrexate. Acetaminophen is particularly well known. Uh, that's Tylenol, and Tylenol toxicity is known to affect the liver. There are some chemicals that are hepatotoxic. This includes pesticides and tetrachloromethane. Tetrachloromethane isn't used as much as it used to be um, once it was realized that it was a hepatotoxic chemical, but there are still some occupational hazards um, that can cause hepatotoxicity. Ingestion of aflatoxin is another cause of hepatotoxicity. This is a toxin produced by aspergillus, and you can find it in some mushrooms. These diseases are all hereditary um, biochemical causes of both hepatotoxicity and hepatitis. So first, hemochromatosis. This is a disorder of iron overload. You're unable to clear the iron in your body, and that iron can cause inflammation in the liver and also be toxic directly to the liver. Wilson's disease is a disease of copper transport. Um, it's also copper um, accumulates in the body, and that can be toxic to the liver and also inflame the liver. 
alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Um, you're missing this enzyme. It leads to a connective tissue disorder, which can inflame the liver. And this one also causes emphysema in the lungs. So if you have a patient that has lung problems and liver problems, usually at a young age, and oftentimes with some family history, you might suspect alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Some more common causes of hepatitis include this chronic viral infection. Hepatitis C is the most common cause of hepatitis leading to cirrhosis from a viral infection, and hepatitis B and D follow that. There are also parasitic infections that can cause hepatitis. These are more common on the Indian subcontinent and the African continent. This includes schistosomiasis, leishmaniasis, and malaria are known to cause hepatitis that can lead to cirrhosis. One of the more common causes of hepatitis, again, is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. This is also known as alcoholic, or sorry, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, NAFLD sometimes, it's abbreviated. And this is caused by uh, metabolic syndrome, essentially. So it's associated with all of these other diseases of metabolic syndrome, including obesity, diabetes mellitus, usually type 2, and hyperlipidemia. These are some other, um, I would say, like inflammatory disorders that uh, can cause hepatitis as well. I think the color coding might be a little off here. I probably would have called, caused these more um, inflammatory. So this should be purple and red instead of purple and green. And um, the first one here is primary sclerosing cholangitis. The next one is primary biliary cholangitis. And the third is autoimmune hepatitis. And again, these are all inflammatory disorders that lead to hepatitis. They usually have some kind of um, hereditary or genetic predisposition, um, sometimes with some HLA um, subtypes that, that they're associated with, and oftentimes with other autoimmune um, like associated conditions like IBD. Next are these vascular causes of cirrhosis. The first here is Osler-Weber-Rendu, also known as hereditary um, hemorrhagic telangiectasia. This is a disease that causes vascular dysplasia, which can directly lead to high fibrous septa in the liver, which again causes this um, compression mass effect of the hepatic sinusoids um, and can mess up the liver architecture. Some others, when you have thrombosis in the hepatic veins, that's called Bud Chiari syndrome, and that can directly affect your pressures in the liver and lead to poor blood flow in the liver. Patients that have congestive heart failure can also have congestive hepatopathy. Um, this is also known as cardiac cirrhosis. Essentially, your heart's not pumping blood. Blood is backing up from your heart into the liver, and that's what's messing up this blood flow here. So that directly inserts you into this part of the pathophysiology. Now that's all the etiologies. There's quite a lot. Um, there are even more manifestations. So let's get started with those. First, since we were talking about this poor blood flow, um, high pressure in the intrasinusoidal space, when that accumulates, when that gets really bad, you can have portal vein hypertension, portal hypertension. That can lead to blood backing up even further back into the GI tract and can cause esophageal varices, which can bleed and um, manifest in chronic blood loss. This portal hypertension also manifests as caput medusa, which is when you have a swollen abdomen with um, bulging, engorged veins. Um, it kind of looks like a head. Um, and you can have splenomegaly as well when that blood backs up into the spleen. And when blood backs up into the spleen, that can also trap um, thrombocytes, and you can have thrombocytopenia resulting from that. There's going to be a few things coming out of this loss of exocrine and metabolic functions. The first is that your liver will no longer be able to detoxify as it used to, and this leads to many downstream effects. So when you cannot detox um, in your body, you'll not be able to produce urea to get rid of nitrogen in your urine, which leads to an accumulation of ammonia. And when you have so much ammonia, it starts to affect your brain. You'll have hepatic encephalopathy, which has a number of symptoms um, in itself, like altered mental status, for instance. Another characteristic one is asterixis, which is caused by high ammonia in the brain. In addition, when you cannot detoxify um, your uh, your body, you'll end up with jaundice, you'll end up with an accumulation of bilirubin leading to jaundice, and you'll have to rethink a lot of medicine metabolism in the body, uh, because of course the body gets, or the, the liver gets rid of these medicines and these metabolites in the body. So you can have like an accumulation disorder of medicines that you otherwise regularly take in a patient that has cirrhosis. You'll have a decrease in synthetic function 
of the liver as well. Um, one cause first is on the testosterone estrogen balance. Decreased synthetic function in the liver can lead to an increase in sex hormone binding globulin, which um, increases the effect of estrogen. Essentially, you're binding up more of your free testosterone in your blood. So the estrogen ends up being more dominant than the uh, testosterone in the patient's blood. This leads to a feminization effect with many downstream effects. Um, you can have hypogonadism, which encapsulates some of these um, other manifestations like amenorrhea, palmar erythema, that's redness on your palms, spider telangiectasia, which are these disordered blood vessels caused by high estrogen that look like spiders on the skin, gynecomastia in men, you can have decreased body hair, decreased libido, and erectile dysfunction in men as well. When you have decreased liver synthetic function, you'll also have decreased albumin, which might show up on your labs. This is one cause of the ascites and possible peripheral edema in patients with cirrhosis. Now it's important to note that the portal hypertension also causes peripheral um, edema and ascites. And there's some debate as to either which of these contributors contributes more to ascites and peripheral edema. Some say it's mostly a uh, blood flow issue. Others say it's mostly an osmotic albumin issue. Um, I think the truth might be more on this uh, portal hypertension side. But in any case, you end up with ascites and possibly lower extremity edema. When you have low synthetic function in the liver, um, the liver is also responsible for making clot or coagulation or clotting factors. So you end up bleeding more. You end up with a bleeding um, diathesis. And this can be petechia and purpura on the skin. Um, and that can also contribute to your blood loss. When you have so much blood loss from the varices, you're bleeding from vomiting, um, from these bleeding diatheses, from having low coagulation factors, the patient can become anemic. This would be an iron deficient microcytic anemia, and that can lead to fatigue and weakness in the patient. Coming back to the synthetic function disorder, the body will not be able to produce bile acids, which um, when you cannot have bile acids in your gut, when you're eating food, you'll have malabsorption of fat soluble vitamins. Remember, this is vitamins D, E, A, and K that will be affected. Those are the fat-soluble vitamins. When you have this vitamin deficiency, uh, one of those vitamins, uh, some, some, some of those vitamins, these, these are not the fat-soluble vitamins, but other ones um, that you can get vitamin deficiency from this loss of liver function are B12 and folate deficiency. And that can further cause an anemia that can lead to fatigue and weakness. Now, it's important to note that these are two different types of anemia. This would be a, mic a macrocytic anemia um, with B12 and folate deficiency, and this would be an iron deficient chronic blood loss anemia, which would be microcytic anemia. So the anemia can be microcytic or macrocytic. Um, in any case, it can make the patient tired and weak. This vitamin D deficiency, um, the, sorry, this vitamin deficiency also results in decreased vitamin D3 hydroxylation, which can cause a secondary hyperparathyroidism in the liver as well. Now, these are largely the liver effects. Um, when you have, in, in addition to these many liver effects, when you have stimulated uh, hepatocyte apoptosis, this can lead to hepatocellular carcinoma, which is um, one of the downstream effects of cirrhosis. Um, and in addition, it can affect other organ systems as well, like the kidneys, you can have hepatorenal syndrome, and the lungs, like in hepatopulmonary syndrome. Now, of course, there are many other downstream effects of hepatorenal and hepatopulmonary syndrome that I'm not listing here. One of them that's worth knowing is hypoxemia from um, poor breathing in the hepatopulmonary syndrome, which can lead to nail clubbing as well. But there are many other manifestations that I wasn't able to fit here. So this was a pretty long overview of cirrhosis and many of the manifestations. I hope this was helpful and thank you for listening.